Hello everyone, we are gonna read chapter one, which is called The Cursed Crow. I'll show you what it looks like. And this says, winter of 11, three days earlier, the kitchen cat was dead and Morgan was to blame. She didn't know how it happened or when. She thought perhaps he'd eaten something poisonous overnight. There were no injuries to su suggest a fox or dog attack. Apart from a bit of dried blood at the corner of his mouth, he looked like he was sleeping, but he was cold and stiff. When she found his body in the weak winter morning light, Morgan crouched down beside him in the dirt, a frown creasing her forehead. She stroked his black pelt from the top of his head to the tip of his bushy tail. Sorry, kitchen cat, she murmured. Morgan thought about where best to bury him and whether she could ask grandmother for a bit of nice linen to wrap him in. Probably best not to, she decided. She'd use one of her own nightshirts. Cook opened the back door to give yesterday's scraps to the dogs and was so startled by Morgan's presence, she nearly dropped her bucket. The old woman peered down at the dead cat and set her mouth in a line. Better his woe than mine, praise be to the divine, she muttered, knocking on the wooden door frame and kissing the pendant she wore around her neck. She glanced sideways at Morgan. I liked that cat. So did I, said Morgan. Oh yes, I can see that. There was a bitter note in her voice and Morgan just noticed she was backing away, inch by wary inch. Go, now, go on now inside, they're waiting for you in his office. Morgan hurried into the, ca the house, hovering for a moment near the door to the kitchen and in the hallway. She watched Cook take a piece of chalk and write, kitchen cat dead on the blackboard. At the end of a long list that most recently included spoiled fish, old Tom's heart attack, floods in North Prosper, gravy stains on best tablecloth. I can recommend several excellent child psychologists in the great old Jekyll of Fox area. The new caseworker hadn't touched her tea and biscuits. She traveled two and a half hours from the capital by rail that morning and walked from the train station to Crow Manor in a wretched drizzle. Her wet hair was plastered to her head and her coat soaked through. Morrigan was struggling to think of a better remedy for this misery than tea and biscuits, but the woman didn't seem interested. I didn't make the tea, said Morrigan, if that's what you're worried about. The woman ignored her. Dr. Fielding is famous for his work with cursed children. I'm sure you've heard of him. Dr. Llewellyn, Llewellyn is also highly regarded if you'd like a gentler, more maternal approach. Morgan's father cleared his throat <clears throat> uncomfortably. That won't be necessary. Corvus had developed a subtle twitch in his left eye that appeared only during these mandatory monthly meetings, which signaled to Morgan that, she, that he hated them as much as she did. Coal black hair and crooked noses aside, it was the only thing father and daughter had in common. Morrigan has no need of counseling, he continued. She's a sensible enough child. She is well acquainted with her situation. The caseworker ch ch chanced a fleeting look at Morrigan, who was sitting beside her on the sofa and trying not to fiddle. These visits always dragged. Chancellor, without wishing to be indelicate, time is short. Experts all agree we're entering the final year of this age, the final year before eventide. Morrigan looked away, out of the window casting her around for a distraction, as she always did when someone mentioned the E word. You must realize this is an important transition period for... Have you the list? Corvus said, with a hint of impatience. He looked pointedly at the clock on his office wall. Of course. She drew a piece of paper from her folder, trembling only slightly. The woman was doing rather well, Morgan thought, considering this was just her second visit. The last caseworker barely spoke above a whisper and would have continued, considered it an invitation to disaster to sit on the same piece of furniture as Morgan. Shall I read it aloud? It's quite short this month. Well done, Miss Crow, she said, 
stiffly. Morgan didn't know what to say. She didn't really take credit for something that she couldn't even control. We'll start with the incidents requiring compensation. The Jackaliflax Town Council has requested 700 cred for damage to a gazebo during a hailstorm. I thought we'd agreed that extreme weather events could no longer be reliably attributed to my daughter, said Corvus. After that forest fire in Ulf turned out to be arson, remember? Yes, Chancellor. However, there is a witness who has indicated that Morrigan is at fault in this case. Who? Corvus demanded. A man who works at the post office overheard Miss Crow remarking to her grandmother on the fine weather Jacqueline Flax had been enjoying. The caseworker looked at her notes. The hail began four hours later. Corvus sighed heavily and leaned back in his chair, shooting an irritated look at Morgan. Very well. Continue. Morgan frowned. She had never in her life remarked on the fine weather Jack Lefax had been having. She did remember turning to grandmother in the post office that day and saying, hot, isn't it? But that was hardly the same thing. A local man, Thomas Bratchett, died of a heart attack recently. He was our gardener. I know, Carvis interrupted. Terrible shame. The hydrangeas have suffered. Morgan, what did you do to the old man? Nothing. Corvus looked skeptical. Nothing? Nothing at all? She thought for a moment. I told him the flower beds looked nice. When? About a year ago? Corvus and the caseworker exchanged a look. The woman sighed quietly. His family is ex being ex extremely generous in the matter. They ask only that you pay his funeral expenses, put his grandchildren through college, and make a donation to his favorite charity. How many grandchildren? Five. Tell them I'll pay for two. Continue. The headmaster at Jekyll Effects. Ah, the woman jumped as Morgan leaned forward to take a cookie, but seemed to calm down when she realized there was no intention to make physical contact. Uh, yes. The headmaster at Jekyll Effects Preparatory School has finally sent us a bill for the fire damage. 2,000 cred ought to cover it. It said in that newspaper that the lunch lady left the stove burner on overnight, said Morrigan. Correct, said the caseworker, her eyes fixed firmly on the paper in front of her. It also said she'd passed Crow Manor the previous day and spotted you on the grounds. So? She said you made eye contact with her? I did not. Morgan felt the blood began to rise. That fire wasn't her fault. She'd never made eye contact with anyone. She knew the rules. The lunch lady was fibbing to get herself out of trouble. It's all in the police report. She's a liar, Morgan turned to her father, but he refused to meet her gaze. Did he really believe she was to blame? The lunch lady admittedly admitted she left the stove burner turned on. The unfairness of it all made Morgan's stomach twist into knots. She's lying. I never. That's quite enough from you, Corvus snapped. Morgan slumped down from her chair, holding her arms tight against her chest. Her father cleared his throat again and nodded at the woman. <clears throat> you may forward me the bill. Please finish the list. I have a full day of meetings ahead. Uh, that's all on the financial side of things, she said, tracing a line down the page with a trembling finger. There are only three apology letters for Miss Crow to write this month. One to a local woman, Mrs. Calpurnia Moloff, for her broken hip. Far too old to be ice skating, Morgan muttered. One to the Jackal of Flax Jam Film Society for, or Society for a ruined batch of marmalade and one to a boy, Pip Gilcrest, who lost the Great Wolfacre State Spelling Championship last week. Morgan's eyes doubled in size. All I did was wish him luck. Precisely, Miss Crow, the caseworker said as she handed the list over to Corvus. You should have known better. Chancellor, I understand you're on a hunt for another tutor. Corvus sighed. My assistants have spoken to ever every agency in Jackalifax and some as far as the capital. It would seem our great state is in the throes of a severe private tuition drought. He raised one dubious eyebrow. What happened to Miss 
the caseworker consulted her notes. Linford, wasn't it? Last time we spoke, you said she was working out very nicely. Feeble woman, Corvus said with a sneer. She barely lasted a week, L just left one afternoon and never returned. Nobody knows why. That wasn't true. Morgan knew why. Miss Linford's fear of the curse prevented her from actually sharing the same room with her student. It was a strange and undignified thing, Morgan felt, to have someone shout Gromish verb congregation, conjugations at you from the other side of a door. Morgan had grown more and more annoyed until finally she'd broken a pen through the keyhole, put her mouth over the end of it, and blown black ink all over Miss Linford's face. She was prepared to admit it wasn't her most sporting moment. At the registry office, we have a short list of teachers who are amenable to working with cursed children. A very short list, said the caseworker with a shrug. But perhaps there will be someone who, Corvus held up a hand to stop her. I see no need. I beg your pardon? You said yourself, it's not long until eventide. Yes, but it's still a year away. Nonetheless, waste of time and money at this stage, isn't it? Morgan glanced up, feeling an unpleasant jolt at her father's words. Even the caseworker looked surprised. With respect, Chancellor, the registry office for cursed children doesn't consider it a waste. We believe education is an important part of every childhood. Corvus narrowed his eyes. Yes, paying for an education seems rather pointless when it is this particular childhood is about to be cut short. Personally, I think we should never have bothered in the first place. I'd be better off sending my hunting dogs to school. They've got a longer life expectancy and are much more useful to me. Morgan exhaled in his blunt oof, as though her father had just thrown a very large brick at her stomach. There it was. The truth she kept squashed down, something she could ignore but never forget. The truth that she and every cursed child knew deep in their bones, had tattooed on their hearts. I'm going to die on eventide night. I'm sure my friends in the winter sea party would agree with me, Corvus continued, glaring at the caseworker, of oblivious to Morgan's unease, particularly the ones who control the funding of your little department. There's a long silence. The caseworker looked sideways at Morrigan and began to gather her belongings. Morrigan recognized the flash of pity that crossed, across, that crossed the woman's face and she hated her for it. Very well. I will inform the ROCC of your decision. Good day, Chancellor, Miss Crow. The caseworker hurried out of the office without a backward glance. Corvus pressed a buzzer on the desk and called for one of his assistants. Morgan rose from her chair. She wanted to shout at her father, but instead her voice came out trembling and timid. Should I do as you're like? Cor Corvus snapped, shuffling through the papers on his desk. Just don't bother me. <sighs> Dear Mrs. Maloof, I'm sorry you don't know how to ice skate properly. Mm, no. I'm sorry you thought it was a good idea to go ice skating, even though you're a million years old and have brittle bones that could snap in a light breeze. Dear Mrs. Maloof, I'm sorry you broke your hip. I didn't mean to. I hope you are recovering quickly. Please accept my apologies and get well soon. Sincerely, Miss Morgan Crow. So she is writing letters to all these people that she apparently like cursed and ruined their day. Sprawled on the floor of the second sitting room, Morrigan wrote, rewrote the last few sentences neatly on a fresh sheet of paper and tucked it into the envelope but didn't seal it, partly because Corvus would want to check the letter before it was sent and partly on the off chance that her saliva had the power to cause sudden death or bankruptcy. The click-clack of hurried footsteps in the hallway made Morrigan freeze. She looked at the clock on the wall, midday. It would be grandmother home for morning tea with her friends or her stepmother Ivy looking for someone to blame for a scratch on the silverware or a tear in the drapes. The second sitting room was usually a good place to hide. It was the glummest room in the house with hardly any sunshine. Nobody liked it except for Morgan. The footsteps faded. Morgan let out a breath she had been holding. Reaching over to the radio, she turned the little brass knob through skew squealing static filled airwaves until she found a station broadcasting the news. 
The annual Winter Dragon Call continues in the northwest corner of the Great Wolf Acre this week, with over 40 rogue reptiles targeted by the Dangerous Wildlife Eradication Force. The DWEF has received increased reports of dragon encounters near Deep Falls Resort and Spa, a popular holiday destination for... Morgan let the news casters posh nasal voice drone in the background as she began her next letter. Dear Pip, I'm sorry you thought triacle was spelled with a K. I'm sorry you're an idiot. I'm sorry to hear you lost your recent spelling bee because you're an idiot. Please accept my deepest apologies for any trouble I may have caused you. I promise I will never wish you luck again, you ungrateful little. Oh, yours faithfully, Morgan Crow. There were now people on the news talking about the homes they'd lost in prosper floods, crying over pets they loved and their loved ones they'd seen washed away in the streets that ran like rivers. Morgan felt a sad, stab of sadness and hoped Corvus was right about the weather not being her fault. Dear Jackalaflex Jam Society, sorry, but I but don't you think there are worse things in life than bad marmalade? Oh. Up next, could Eventide be closer than we think? Asked the newscaster. Morgan grew still, the E word again. While most experts agree we've had one more year until the current age ends, a small number of fringe chronologists believe that we could be celebrating the night of Eventide much sooner than that. Have they cracked it or are they just crackpots? A tiny chill crept along the back of Morgan's neck, but she annoyed, ignored it. Crackpots, she thought defiantly. But first, most unrest in the capital today as rumors of an imminent wonder shortage continue to spread. The nasal newscaster continue. A spokesperson for Squall Industries publicly addressed concerns at a press conference this morning. The man's vo voice spoke softly over the background hum of murmuring, murmuring journalist. There is no crisis at Squall Industries. Rumors of an energy shortage in the Republic are entirely false. I cannot stress that enough. Speak up, someone yelled in the background. A little man raised his voice a little. The Republic is as full of wonder as it has ever been, and we continue to reap the rewards of this abundant natural resource. Mr. Jones, a reporter called out, will you respond to the reports of mass power outages and malfunctioning wondrous technology in the states of Southlight and Far East Sang? Is Ezra Squall aware of these problems? Will he emerge from his reclusive lifestyle to address the problem publicly? Mr. Jones again cleared his throat. <clears throat> again, these are no more than silly rumors and fear mongering. Our state of the art monitoring systems show no wonder scarcity, no malfunction of wondrous devices. The National Rail Network is operating perfectly, as are the power grid and the wondrous healthcare service. As for Mr. Squall, he is well aware that the nation's sole provider of wonder and its byproducts, Squall Industries, has a great responsibility. We are as committed as ever. Mr. Jones, there's been speculation as to whether the wonder shortage could have anything to do with cursed children. Can you comment? Morgan dropped her pen. I'm I'm not sure. I'm I'm not sure what you mean, stammered Mr. Jones sounded taking a taking aback. The reporter continued, well, South, Southlight and Far East Sang between them have three cursed children listed on their state registers. Unlike the state of Prosper, which has no cursed children at present and has remained untouched by wonder shortages. Great Wolf Acre has also a registered cursed child, the daughter of a prominent politician, Corvus Crow. Could it be the next state hit by this crisis? Once again, there is no crisis. Morgan groaned and turned off the radio. Now she was being blamed for something that hadn't even happened yet. How many apology letters would she have to write next month? Her hand began to cramp at the thought. She picked up her pen. Dear Jekyll Effects Jam Society, sorry about the marmalade. Yours, M. Crow. Morgan's father was a chancellor of Great Wolfacre, the largest of four states that made up the Winter Sea Republic. 
He was very busy and important and usually still working, even on the rare occasions when he was home for dinner. On his left and right would sit left and right. His ever-present assistants. Corvus was always firing his assistants and hiring new ones, so he had given up calling them by their real names. Send a memo to General Wilson right, he was saying when Morgan sat at the table that evening. Across from her sat her stepmother Ivy. Way down to the other end of the table was grandmother. Nobody looked at Morgan. His office will need to submit a budget for the new field hospital by early spring at the latest. Yes, Chancellor, said Bright, holding up blue fabric samples. And for the new upholstery in your office? The cerulean, I think. Talk to my wife about it. She is the expert on that sort of thing, aren't you, darling? Ivy smiled radiantly. The periwinkle, dearest, she said with a tinkling, breezy laugh to match your eyes. Morgan's stepmother didn't look like she belonged at Crow Manor. Her spun gold hair and sun-kissed skin, a souvenir from the summer she just spent, de-stressifying on the gorgeous be beaches of Southeast Prosper, were out of place among the midnight black hair and pale, stickly complexions of the Crow family. Crows never tanned. Morgan thought perhaps that was why her father liked Ivy so much. She was nothing like the rest of them. Sitting in their dreary dining room, Ivy looked like an exotic artwork she had brought back from vacation. Left any word from Camp 16 on the measles outbreak? Contained, sir, but they're still experiencing powder, power outages. How often? Once a week, sometimes twice, there's disconsent, discontent in the border towns. At Great Wolf Acre? Are you certain? Nothing like the rioting in southern South Light slums, sir, just low-level panic. And they think it's due to wonder scarcity? Nonsense. We're not having any problems here. Crow Manor has never functioned more smoothly. Look at those lights, bright as day. Our generators must be full to the brim. Yes, sir, said Lift, left looking more uncomfortable. That has gone hasn't gone unnoticed by the public. Oh, wine, 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 croaked a voice from the opposite end of the table. Grandmother was dressed formally for dinner as usual in a long black dress with jewels around her neck and on her fingers. Her coarse steel gray hair was piled in a formidable bun atop her head. I don't believe there is a wonder shortage, just freeloaders who haven't paid their energy bills. I wouldn't blame that Ezra Squall if she cut them off. She sliced her steak into tiny bloody pieces as she spoke. Clear tomorrow's schedule, Corvus told his assistants. I'll pay the border towns a visit, do a bit of handshaking, and that should shut them up. Grandmother gave a mean little laugh. It's their heads that need shaking. You have a spine, Corvus. Why don't you use it? Corvus' face turned sour. Morgan tried not to smile. She had once heard a maid whisper that grandmother was a savage old bird of prey dressed up as a lady. Morgan privately agreed, but found she'd rather enjoyed the savagery when it wasn't aimed at her. It's bid day tomorrow, sir, said Left. You're expected to make a speech of the local eligible children. Good Lord, you're right. No, nope, thought Morgan as she spooned carrots into her plate. She's, he's left. What a nuisance. I don't suppose I can cancel this year. Where and when? Town hall, midday, said Wright. Children's from St. Christopher's School, Mary Henright Academy, and Jekyll Flax Prep will attend. Fine, Corvus sighed unhappily, but call the Chronicle. Make sure they have someone covering it. Morgan swallowed a mouthful of bread. What's bid day? As often happened when Morgan spoke, everyone turned to face her with vague looks of surprise as though she were a lamp that had suddenly grown legs and started tap dancing across the room. There was a moment of silence, and then, perhaps we can invite the charity schools, schools to town hall, her father continued, as though nobody had spoken. Good publicity doing things for the underclass. Grandmother groaned. Corvus, for goodness sake, you only need one idiot child to pose for a photo, and you'll have hundreds to choose from. Just pick the most photogenic one, shake its hand, and leave. There's no need to complicate things. Hmm, he said, nodding. Quite right, mother. Pass the salt, would you, left? Wright cleared his throat timidly. Actually, sure, perhaps it's not a bad idea to include the less privileged schools. It might get us a front page. Your approval rating in the backwoods would do a boost, added Left as he scuttled down the table to fetch the salt. No need to be delicate, Left. 
Corvus lifted his eyebrow and glanced sideways at his daughter. My approval rating everywhere could do with a boost. Morgan felt the tiniest tremor of guilt. She knew her father's magic challenge in life was major challenge in life was to maintain his grip on the affections of great wolf acres voting public while his only child brought about their every misfortune. That he was enjoying his fifth year as state counselor, despite such a handicap, was a daily miracle to Corvus Crow, and the decision of whether he could sustain his implausible luck for another year was a daily anxiety. But mother's right, let's not overcrowd the event, he continued. Find a way to get me a front page. Is it an auction? asked Morgan. Auction, Corvus snapped. What the devil are you talking about? Bid day. Oh, for goodness sake. He made a noise of impatience and turned back to his papers. Ivy, explain. Bid day, began Ivy, drawing herself up importantly, is a day when children who, have com children who have completed preparatory school will receive their educational bid should they be lucky enough or rich enough, added grandmother. Yes, Ivy continued, looking mildly put out by the interruption. If they are very bright or talented, or if their parents are wealthy enough to bribe someone, then some respectable person from a fine scholarly institution will come to bid on them. Does everyone get a bid? Morgan asked. Heavens no! Ivy laughed, glancing at the maid who'd come to place a tureen of gravy on the table. She added in an exaggerated whisper, if everyone were educated. Where would servants come from? But that's not fair, Morgan protested, frowning as she watched the maids scurry from the room, red-faced. And I don't understand. What are they bidding for? For the pri privilege of overseeing the child's education, Corvus interrupted impatiently, waving a hand in front of his face as though to brush the conversation away. The glory of shaping the young minds of tomorrow and so on. Stop asking questions. It's nothing to do with you. Left, what time is my meeting with the chairman of the Farming Commission on Thursday? Three o'clock, sir. Can I come? Corvus blinked repeatedly, a frown deepening from the lines in his forehead. Why would you want to attend my meeting with the chairman of, to bid day, I mean, tomorrow the ceremony at town hall? You, her stepmother said. Go to a bid day ceremony? Whatever for. I just, Morgan paused, suddenly unsure. Well, it is my birthday this week and it would be a birthday present. Her family continued to stare blankly, which confirmed Morgan's suspicions that they'd forgotten she was turning 11 the day after tomorrow. I thought it might be fun. She trailed off looking at her plate and dearly wished she hadn't opened her mouth at all. It's not fun, sneered Corvus. It's politics. I know you may not. Out of the question. Ridiculous idea. Morgan sank down in her chair, feeling deflated and foolish. Really, what had she expected? Corvus was right. It was a ridiculous idea. The crows ate their dinner in tense silence for several minutes until... Actually, sir, said Wright in a tentative voice. Corvus cla cut cutlery clattered into his plate. He fixed his assistant with a menacing stare. What? Well, if you were, and I'm not saying you should, but if you were to take your daughter along, it might help to, uh, er, soften your image to a degree. Left wrung his hands. Sir, I think right is, um, right. Corvus glowered and left rushed on nervously. What I mean is, according to polls, the people of Great Wolfacre see you as a bit, um, remote? Aloof, rejected, interjected right. It would hurt your approval. It wouldn't, it couldn't hurt your approval rating to remind them that you're about to become a grieving father. From a journalist's point of view, it might take the turn of events a unique point of interest. How unique? Front page unique? Corvus was silent. Morgan thought she saw his left eye twitch. All right, that was a long chapter. That is all for today. Um, I wonder what you guys think about bid day. Like this idea that if you are rich and powerful, you get into a very good school. And it sounds like if you um, don't have as much money, you do not get into a very good school. I'm curious what you guys think about that. Is that right? Not right? Um, 
what is what do things look like in our world because obviously this book takes place in kind of a different world so i'm curious to your thoughts on that and we will read more tomorrow goodbye you guys maybe if my remote would work <laughs>